You're listening to the Rauha, daily guidance for seekers with Sheikh Faraz Rabbani. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa afdalu salati wa tammu taslim. Ala nabiyil mabuuthi rahmatan lil alameen. Sayyidina wa nabiyina wa kurrati ayunina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa atbaihi ila yawmuddin. Alhamdulillah. In our Rauha sessions, in which we look at some of the guidance of the Prophet and some advice for seekers of Islamic knowledge. We have reached hadith number 12 of Sheikh Yusuf and Nabahani's set of 40 hadiths on the virtues of the beloved Messenger of Allah And the look at these virtues is meant to stir within us a renewed attachment to the Prophet ﷺ and greater love and reverence for the Messenger So, hadith number 12, which is related by Sayyidina Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, an Anasin radiallahu ta'ala anhu, أنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أوحى الله تعالى إلى موسى Allah most high revealed to Sayyidina Musa نبئ بني إسرائيل أنه من لقيني وهو جاحد بأحمد أدخله النار that he said to Sayyidina Musa, inform Bani Israel that whoever comes to face me, having rejected Ahmad, I shall enter into hellfire. Qala ya Rabb, wa man Ahmad? And Sayyidina Musa said, O Lord, and who is Ahmad? Allah Most High responded, Qal ma khalaqtu khalqan akrama aliyya minhu. I did not create any creation more honored by me or more honorable to me than him. كَتَبْتُ اسْمَهُ مَعَسْمِي فِي الْعَرْشِ قَبْلَ أَنْ أَخْلُقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ said, I inscribed his name with my name on the throne before I created the heavens and the earth. إِنَّ الْجَنَّةِ مُحَرَّمَةٌ عَلَى جَمِيعِ خَلْقِ حَتَّى يَدْخُلَهَا هُوَ وَأُمَّتُهُ And paradise is in, cannot be entered or is prohibited for all creation until he enters it, him and his community. So Sayyidina Musa asked, وَمَنْ أُمَّتُهُ Who is his community? Right? Who is his community? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded, الحمادون, The most praising ones. يَحْمَدُونَ سُعُودًا وَهُبُوطًا They praise when ascending and when descending. وَعَلَى كُلِّ حَال And in all states يَشُدُّونَ أَوْصَاتَهُمْ They tie their belts. They, they tighten their belts. وَيُطَهِّرُونَ أَطْرَافَهُمْ And they purify their limbs. صَائِمُونَ بِالنَّهَارِ Ruhbanun bil They are given to fasting by day and are devotees by night. Aqbalu minhumul yasir. I accept from them a, a little, you know, the, the little works. Wa udhiluhumul jannah bi shahadati Allah ilaha illallah. And I enter them in paradise. 
for the testification that there is no God but God. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's description of the Ummah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the first characteristic of the Ummah is they are the Hamadun, the most praising, right? the most praising. Hamad is from, is the, is Fa'al, right? and Fa'al is the one who intensively engages in the meaning of the root, and Hamd is to praise. And Hamadun, they're the, those who most praise Allah, right? And of course, this is one of the characteristics of the prayer. One of the characteristics of the prayer. We, the Fatiha, the Fatiha is Surah Al-Hamd. It is of the most eloquent ways to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we pray throughout the day. Not just with the Fatiha, but also we affirm in it, Subhana Rabb, um, you know, Sami Allahu liman hamida. Rabbana lak alhamd. Allah hears those who praise Him. Rabbana lak alhamd. O, o Lord of ours, yours is all praise. And elsewhere in the prayer, afterwards we make the tasbihs, con, you know, containing the praise. We say alhamdulillah 33 times. If you consider the number of times the believer just in the five prayers and after it says alhamdulillah, it's a large number. But this, of course, the intisab, the ascription to the ummah of the Prophet there's a general ascription that anyone who follows him will be praising Allah much more than anyone who isn't. Right? Just by virtue of performing the five prayers. But they're hamadun, but there's also a recognition of those who are truly following him. They are the most praising, and the, that's why the divine response said, "Yahmaduna su'udan wa hubuta." They praise in their ascents and in their descents, right? And so, you know, when they're out and about, they go up a hill. They say, "Alhamdulillah." They come down. They say, "Alhamdulillah," like meaning in all their worldly affairs. And this su'udan hubut relates to outward affairs, and it can also be in all their states, whether elated or straightened. They praise Allah. And in all their states, they praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu expressed it. The believer may be facing death, yet they are content and praising Allah. وَهُوْ يَحْمَدُ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى they tighten their, their, their belts, meaning that they strive, right? they strive. يُطَهِّرُونَ right? أَطْرَافَهُمْ They purify their limbs. They, that's the gift of wudu, outwardly. And they purify their limbs from sins. And taqwa, the majari of taqwa, the the your taqwa of Allah, mindfulness of Allah is manifest upon the limbs, the outward limbs and the greatest limb which is the heart. Sa'imuna bin Nahar, they are frequent in fasting by day. Right? One adopts the sunnah fasting, striving to fast three days of every month. The special Days of the year, such as the day of Arafah, that is coming in a month's time, the or Nisf Shaban, other such days, uh, the tenth of Muharram, and then the special occasions, such as fasting during the ten, the first nine days of. Dhul Hijjah. 
and then the other sunnah fast of fasting Mondays and Thursdays, fasting the middays of each lunar month, etc. Ruhbanun bilayl. Ruhban is plural of? Of rahib. And the rahib is? The rahib is referred to a monk, right? To, to, it was a term used to describe monks, but they're devotees. They are fully devoted to, to Allah. Right? And, this, uh, and some of the Salaf taking from this, they say, you know, they describe the Sahaba, that Fursanun bin Nahar, Ruhbanun bin Layl. They were warriors by day and monk uh, devotees by night. Right? Devotees by night, how? Following the Sunnah of night prayer. Stand the night in worship, but a little. I accept from them even a little good deeds. Right? Because of the great rank and virtue and honor of the Ummah of the Messenger. Right? And I enter them paradise. The condition for paradise is to die upon La ilaha illallah. The state, the, the state, the witness that there is no God but Allah. So Sayyidina Musa said, Ij'al, Ij'alni nabiyya tilka al-ummah. So Sayyidina Musa said, make, make me the prophet of that ummah. Because he's already a prophet and you seek the highest of matters. So if that's, that's such an honored ummah, then make me the prophet of that ummah. Qala tabarak wa ta'ala, nabiyuha minha. Allah Most High responded, its prophet is from it. Qala ij'alli min ummati thalik al-nabi. So Sayyidina Musa said, make, so make me from the community of that prophet. Qala istakhdamta wa istakhar. said, you have come before and he has come after. Lakin sa'ajma'u baynaka wa baynahu fi daril jalal. said, but I will gather between him and between you in the abode of majesty. Rahu Abu Nu'im. And this is related by Abu Nu'im in his, um, in his works, Abu Nu'im al Isfahani. So this is telling us a little about the preeminence of the Prophet ﷺ and also the great rank of his ummah. There are many, many hadiths about that, which is why it is a bid'ah, it is an innovation to make blanket negative statements about the Muslims and the state of the Muslims. And the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ قَالَ هَلَكَ النَّاسِ فَهُوَ أَهْلَكُهُمْ Whoever says that the people are ruined, they are the most ruined of them. And there's another narration. Man qala halak nas fa huwa ahlakahum. Whoever says the people are ruined, he has they have ruined him. They have ruined the ummah, the people. Why? Because the, the believer is someone who is praying for the good, is concerned for the good and praying for it. There's this Indian scholar, someone asked how, about permissibility of praying for, against one's enemy if oppressed. He said, if you're oppressed, don't forget to pray to get out of your oppression first. Right? If you get out of your oppression, the oppression, oppressor no longer really matters. And that's the first thing. Right? So if there's, there's oppression, you pray against the oppressor, there's wrongdoing, you pray against the wrongdoer. But you're still stuck in exactly the same spot. Except there's no oppression, but you're still stuck there. Right? So, um, the next hadith, Al Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, at al Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bi kitabin, asabahu min ba'di. أهل الكتاب فقرأه عليه فغضب 
So Sayyidina Jabir relates that, that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that Say, Sayyidina Umar, came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam with some writing that he obtained from some of the people of the book and he, re and he read it to him and he read it to him. Sayyidina Umar read it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So he was فَغَضِبْ and the Prophet ﷺ was upset. وَقَالْ لَقَدْ جِئْتُكُمْ بِهَا بَيْضَاءَ نَقِيَّةً لَا, تسأل لا تَسْأَلُوهُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ فَيُخْبِرُوكُمْ so the Prophet ﷺ said, I have come to you with it, meaning with guidance that is clear and pure. Right? Don't ask them about anything, lest they tell you what is true and you reject it, or they tell you what is false, and you accept it. Right. I have come to you with it, meaning with guidance. Right. And the ulama explained that we do not seek, it is prohibited to approach the previous revelations seeking guidance, seeking religious guidance. Why? One, because they've been corrupted. Those, the previous revelations have been corrupted. So it's not a reliable, decisive source of guidance, particularly in matters of belief, but also in matters of practice. And number two, it's been abrogated. And number three, the Qur'an and the Sunnah are a sufficiency for the believer. So joining between such hadiths and the hadiths saying, Haddithu an Bani Israel, relate from Bani Israel, wala haraj, and there's no harm. But then he said, La tusaddiquhum wa la tukadhibuhum. Do not believe them and do not reject them. That here, these hadith, jitukum biha, I have come to you with it, meaning with guidance. Right? That we take our guidance from the Quran and the Sunnah. And then the other hadith he said, Haddithu an Bani Israel. Relate from Bani Israel. Right? You're not taking guidance from them, but you say, according to the biblical tradition, such and such. So you relate the things that do not go against the guidance that they tell you, like you want to tell the story of Sayyidina Musa, you find in the biblical tradition what the castle looked like. That's not guidance. That's details. Or there's the name of the children of one of the prophets. So, for example, the children of Sayyidina Yaqub, are, they, are their names mentioned in the Qur'an? No. Actually, Al-Khadr's name is not mentioned, although that, that's mentioned in hadiths. So, those kinds of details, you relate them, but without believing in them. So, we don't take guidance from them. We don't accept what they affirm as, as guidance in terms of the truths that we embrace in faith or the acts that we engage in, in practice. But the condition for delving into the biblical, tradi into the biblical tradition and by extension any other books of books related to, to, to faith and beliefs, is that one must be well rooted in one's own guidance first. What are you do reading? Doing reading the, um, you know, something about the essential teachings of, of Buddha when you don't know the essential teachings of Muhammad, alayhi salatu that, That's 
that's not correct. Here we also see that it is a mode of teaching. And there's other examples that a teacher may rebuke a student publicly. in order to teach others, in order to teach others. Of course, within the bounds of the adab of the deen and the limits of the deen and the akhlaq entailed by the deen. Okay? Um, and in here, the Prophet ﷺ did not put him down. He was upset by what he did and he corrected him, but he corrected him in a positive manner. But this is still you know, a public rebuke is, is hard. Right? And of course, Sayyidina Omar was at a level of bearing that, even though the default is that someone be corrected privately. And there's So this, this hadith highlights the purity and preservation of the guidance that the Prophet ﷺ has come with. Right? That's unique. That is unique. There's even things that are much more recent. Right? Much more recent, there's differences between editions. People are not sure what is the final version of different modern plays that are just within the last 50, 60 years. And they'll say this is the director's cut. This is the playwright's final version. And they, and they differ, even though it was performed in, in that playwright's lifetime. Shakespeare's works, there's a lot of discussion on the different versions. Many great poets there. And these are just within the last few centuries. And we'll see more of the virtues of the Prophet ﷺ and his ummah. We also see the guidance with respect to taking off other religious traditions. We'll, we'll look briefly at some of Imam Ghazali's advice to s seekers of knowledge in, from his work, Ayyuhal Walad. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ayyuhal Walad, fayyambaghi laka. Imam al-Ghazali says about the necessity of basing one's religious knowledge and action on following. On following of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and in the prophetic way. So he says, Ayyuha al-Walad, dear child, فَيَنْبَغِي لَكَ أن يكون قولك وفعلك موافقا للشرع. It is incumbent upon you that your words and your actions be in accordance with divine guidance, the شرع. إذا العلم والعمل بلا اقتداء الشرع ضلالة. Because knowledge and action without following divine guidance is misguidance and this is connected to what he talked about before about to know what is what is what it, what it means to obey and obey in, obeying Allah and his messenger entails following but we see also here an important part that for a student of of islamic knowledge and every believer at some level needs to be a student of islamic knowledge because our but because obedience to the divine command requires knowledge of the divine command. And doing what Allah has made praiseworthy requires knowledge of what is praiseworthy. With, so every, every, every believer needs to be a seeker of knowledge at some level. And anyone who is a concerned believer needs to actively seek sufficient knowledge to be able not only to do what's obligatory for them, but also what is recommended. And that's why the Prophet said, 
مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي دِينُ Whomever Allah wishes well for, He grants deep understanding of religion. The hadith related by Bukhari and Muslim. But for a student of knowledge, they need to seek knowledge of the Islamic sciences, but they also need to acquire what we can call knowledge of the devotional sciences. The devotional sciences meaning knowledge of the Qur'an and of the Sunnah. Right? Because one studies the Islamic sciences, these are, this is what is understood and required to know of the Qur'an and the Sunnah as guidance. But without being connected to the devotional sciences, the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and the tools for understanding the Qur'an and the, and the Sunnah, and of connecting with them, one's knowledge will be disconnected from the command of Allah and His Messenger. Just as if you only read the Qur'an and the Sunnah without the Islamic sciences, you will misunderstand, misinterpret, and be misguided. But also, while seeking Islamic knowledge, one needs to have a daily point of connection with the Qur'an by reading it. One should be striving to correct one's, rec one's recitation of the Qur'an. And one needs to be striving to have some point of understanding the Qur'an and its meanings. Likewise, with hadith, one should have a daily point of connection with hadith of the Prophet um, and his guidance. Um, because with, without that, then the knowledge will not benefit. And of course, one needs to be care careful that the knowledge one takes is knowledge that enables one to follow. Right? It is not just theory and philosophy. And he says, وَيَنْبَغِي لَكَ أَلَّا تَغْتَرَّ بِشَطَحِ وَطَمَّاتِ الصُّوفِيَةِ and it is incumbent upon you that you not be deluded by the ecstatic statements and absurd affirmations of some Sufis. Okay? And as sufiya here, the L is a referential L, as he'll make clear. Because right? he'll define what is true spirituality. Right? The, the, the L here is referential of some Sufis, of some of the people of the spiritual path. Right? Ecstatic utterances, some were genuine. Some, in the intensity of their state with Allah, they, would, they may have uttered some things that were not sound by the st standards of the sacred law, and these are, they're not to be followed in those, and they're not, these statements are not to be accepted. Right? And likewise, the, 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 the shocking actions, because the... لأن سلوك هذا الطريق يكون بالمجاهدة وقطع شهوة النفس وقد وقتل هواها بسيف الرياضة. He says because the the traveling of the spiritual path is is only through spiritual striving, meaning that the spiritual path is not about eloquent poetry and ecstatic utterances and so on, and so on so said this, and so on said this amazing thing, wow. That is not the spiritual path. Rather, it is only by mujahada, by spiritual striving, as is the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Mujahidu man jahada nafsahu lillahi azza wa jal. The mujahid, the, the one who strives, is one who strives against their own lower self, for the sake of Allah, and cutting off the, the desires of one's lower self, those desires towards the prohibited. وَقَتْلِ هَوَاهَا And killing its caprice, right, which is its wayward inclinations. بِسَيْفِ riyada, By the sword of spiritual discipline, right, of spiritual training literally, or, or spiritual discipline. Okay. And one needs to have, then this is the third aspect of, a, of what a seeker of knowledge needs in their 
seeking of beneficial knowledge. They need to seek Islamic knowledge, but they also need to seek devotional knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah, and they need to be take off, they need to engage in spiritual refinement so that they rid themselves of their blameworthy qualities. And then he closes this with a warning. He says, Wa'alam anna al-lisan al-mutlaq wal qalb al-mutbaq al-mamlu'a bil-ghaflati wal-shahwati alamatu al-shaqawa. He says, know well that the unrestrained tongue and the sealed heart that is filled with heedlessness and desires are, are a sign of shaqawa, of being of the people of eternal loss. Right? Al-lisan al-mutlaq and the unrestrained tongue. Why? Because it's clear from the Quran and the Sunnah that a condition for being on the straight path is to control one's speech. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu o you who believe ittaqullah be mindful of Allah wa qulu qawlan sadida and speak only words that are upright that are purposeful that are positive. Yuslih lakum a'malakum then Allah will rectify for you your deeds. وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ and, and He will forgive for you your sins. وَمَنْ يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ And whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا has indeed succeeded with a tremendous success. What is the only action of obedience that is mentioned in this verse? It is to speak words that are upright, purposeful and positive. قُولُوا قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا And we know from the hadith of Sayyidina Mu'adh that our people dragged to hell by anything but the harvest of their tongues and the sealed heart, the closed heart. And that's the heart that is closed, that has not been turned towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is not being polished because the heart is like a mirror, but it requires polishing. And if it's not polished, it will cloud and rust and corrode. الْمَمْلُوءَ بِالْغَفْلَ And why is it closed? Because it has been filled with heedlessness. وَالشَّهْوَةَ And desires are a sign of perdition. And we know the hadith that إِنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ لَمُضْغَ Truly in the body is a morsel of flesh. إِذَا صَلَحَتْ if it's rectified, the entire body is rectified. And if it's corrupted, the entire body is corrupted. Right? And truly, truly it is the heart. He says, Until you don't kill your lower self with true striving, true striving. Right? Right? And those who strive for our sake, we shall surely guide to the pathways to us. Right? If you, unless you need. تُحْيَى قَلْبَكَ بِأَنْوَارِ الْمَعْرِفَةِ Until you, you don't kill your lower self with true and sincere striving, you will, you will not bring your heart to life with the lights of knowing Allah, with the light of true conscious faith. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us that. صلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم ارزقنا قلوبا حيه محلى 
بأنوار معرفتك وطهر قلوبنا وألسنتنا من كل وصف يبعدنا عنك وعن مشاهدتك وعن رضاك وقربك بفضلك وكرمك وجودك يا رب العالمين وصل وسلم وبارك على سيد المرسلين صاحب القلب السليم والخلق العظيم سيدنا ونبينا محمد سيد الأولين والآخرين وآله وصحبه وأحبابه إلى يوم الدين وأخذ دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين Thank you for listening to the Rauha, daily guidance for seekers with Sheikh Faroz Rabbani. Help Seekers Hub give light to millions around the world by supporting us through monthly donations by going to seekershub.org slash donate. Your donations are tax deductible in the U.S. and Canada.